This past Sunday, the church celebrated what is called the Solemnity of the Most Holy Trinity. It's a day to contemplate what is, in one sense, an extremely simple question, while at the same time to ponder one of the greatest mysteries. Who is God? I say simplest of questions because who on earth has never heard of God? Even atheists, even those who know nothing of Christianity, have an idea of what God is. The concept of God is in secular society. It's in our popular language and phrases. In fact, I suspect if you asked every single person in the Western world who or what God is, they would probably give you almost the exact same answer. Which sounds great at first, until you realize that the understanding that most people have of God is far from correct. Think about how God is portrayed in pop culture. Bruce Almighty, Monty Python, The Simpsons, in almost every depiction, what we get is a singular being, generally an older man who is powerful, wise, and giving. He knows everything about us because he can see and hear us from anywhere, but usually spends his time in the clouds or in a distant place. People claim to have seen him before, but no one can ever produce verifiable proof. A few years ago, sociologists studying the religious beliefs and practices of teenagers confirmed this notion of God, summarizing what they believed most people thought of God in three words. Moralistic, therapeutic, deism. Moralistic in that God is a being most concerned with rules. If we want to please God, we must follow his rules, no matter how arbitrary or contrary to reason they may be. Religion is about obedience. Therapeutic in that God seeks to comfort those who obey his rules, that he forgives the faithful when they make mistakes, consoles those who are scared, and helps those in need. And deism because, well, God is like a watchmaker. He created everything, set it in motion, and then mostly lets it run itself. He looks on, but generally remains detached and distant. Moralistic, therapeutic deism. For many people, this is what faith in God boils down to. For Christians, this is Santa Claus. <laughs> really, when you peel back the layers of what people's understanding of God really is, what we see is that God is nothing more than Santa Claus, a metaphysical teddy bear, a powerful, comforting force that gives us assurance that we're on the right path and that everything will be okay, but that doesn't really speak, doesn't really engage, doesn't really challenge doesn't really give life. The truth is that Christians don't worship a God anything like this. The truth is that this conception of God is so far removed from our own belief that it effectively represents an entirely different God. If you're an atheist rejecting God because this is what you see people believing in, I'm with you. That is a deficient understanding of our God. As Christians, we believe in a Trinitarian God. Not an old man with a beard, but a relationship of persons, a community of love. Each person is the same in essence, unified in being, yet is distinct in relationship and mission. Over the years, there have been many analogies attempting to capture this mystery, explaining it in a way that we can understand. Admittedly, they all fall short in one way or another, but I've always liked the one of the speaker. The Father is the one who speaks, Jesus is the word that is spoken, and the Spirit is the breath that speaks the word. All three are distinct in function and relationship to one another, and yet they're inseparable. How could you speak a word without a breath? Where does the breath come from but the speaker? The three acts are one, and the one issues forth as three. In this way, the defining features of our God is that he's a community of love sent forth on mission. Thus, when we look to scripture, we see that the idea of God being nothing more than a moralistic being makes no sense. Sure, God institutes laws and sets a way for us to live, but those laws are never arbitrary ends in themselves. Rather, what we see is that they offer us guides to live in a fuller sense of the truth. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Jesus did not come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people alive. His mission wasn't primarily a moral one, it was a life-giving one. The Holy Spirit does not come to judge, but to give us the gifts of wisdom and understanding, to know that there is good and evil, that good things will bring life and evil things will bring us death. Think of it like the rules in a kindergarten classroom. Imagine what life would be like for the teacher if there were no rules. Chaos. Kids need boundaries, they need direction. It's actually through rules early on in life that they're able to grow and flourish into authentic human beings that hopefully won't need those rules someday. 
The moral life is not an end in itself, but is a means by which humans come to know God and live in the fullness of his love. God's work is far greater than simple moralism. The same can be said about the idea of God merely being therapeutic. Again, there is definitely some truth to the idea that God comforts the afflicted, but scripture also reveals that he is just as active in his work of afflicting the comfortable, of unsettling the rich and the arrogant that need to be converted. It's true that Jesus is seen countless times healing the sick and the lame, including the outcast and consoling the sorrowful, but let's not forget that he also challenges the Pharisees and denounces the arrogant. The Holy Spirit is often depicted as the wind, and in some ways that means a warm summer breeze, refreshing us and bringing us comfort. But the Acts of the Apostles also describes this wind as strong and driving. I think of the winds that howl through the side streets of Chicago, that rush from hurricanes onto coastlands. The Spirit can be the sort of wind that moves you, that knocks you over even destroys. God is far more than just therapeutic. And then deism, well, you just kind of have to laugh. The triune God that we worship is certainly a transcendent being, but he's also an imminent being existing in and through us. Jesus ascended to the Father after the resurrection, yes, but let's not forget the major acts of humility that preceded this. The incarnation, the crucifixion, Jesus came from on high to live with his people as his people. Even now, he has told his disciples that he is with us always, that he is with the poor, he is truly present in the Eucharist and in the Word, that whenever two or three are gathered in his name, he is there. Yes, the Holy Spirit is elusive, he doesn't even have a name, let alone a physical appearance, and yet he is ever-present, speaking to us from within. When we find wisdom guiding our conscience, that's him. When we feel our hearts filled with love, capable of doing something that we never thought possible, that is him. Deistic? No. Nothing could be further from the truth. Our God came to be like us, experienced all that we experience but sin, and remains ever close to us. He lives and breathes in our very being, and without him, nothing would exist. God is not just some far-off being in the clouds. He's right here. To hear that so many people's notion of God is nothing more than moralistic, therapeutic deism is not entirely surprising, but it is pretty saddening. What a deficient faith. What a horrible thing to devote one's life to. The triune God of Scripture, living and true, is an entirely different God that many people simply don't know. Which brings me to the ultimate point of this video. Who cares? What difference does it make? For many, a discussion like this is abstract. It's the work of theologians and philosophers in some ivory tower classroom. No one's going to criticize having accurate theological language, but are these distinctions really that important to the average Christian? Yes, if being a religious person is about not only believing in God, but obeying and imitating God, then one's understanding of the divine is going to have a tremendous effect on one's life. Think about it. If your notion of God is nothing more than moralistic, therapeutic deism, if that is your ultimate ideal for the perfect being, then your life is going to be guided by a desire to become a more detached, judgmental person. There might be the occasional act of charity, but there's never going to be a sense of justice, no sense of community, no sense of humility or intimacy. If God is stoic and morally pure, then his people are going to try to be that as well. It's no wonder then that we see so many people outright rejecting the notion of God. Frankly, if this was all that was presented to me, a God and people that judged from afar and cared little of the world, I might too. But that is just not our God. Our God is intimate and imminent, humble and approachable, comforting yet challenging, altogether involved in the life of the world, ever renewing the face of the earth. This is the model that Jesus and the Holy Spirit have set for us in their relationships and missions, and it should be ours as well. For just as Jesus and the Holy Spirit are sent forth from the community of love to give life and to return all life to the Father, so too are we as the church. We are a community of love bound together in unity and diversity, but are sent forth into the world to share the word and to incorporate more of the world into our community. We are sent out to bring back. Our God is not a static God, but a missionary God. Our God does not set rules and then judge from afar, 
but wants nothing more than for all of creation to live in the fullness of truth and love. Our God is not satisfied by the world as it is, and neither should we. If you believe in the triune God of Scripture, it's time to take up his mission.